All right, welcome everybody to uh, the That's My Entertainment interview, my first one. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to be here because I have a great guest. Uh, you know him as uh, the man behind uh, such creative works as uh, Grounded for Life, uh, The New Adventures of Old Christine, and uh, one of the creators of the new show Trial and Error on NBC. Uh, we have Jeff Astaroff. Say hi, Jeff. Hi, how are you? This is fantastic. You were doing such a good job. I, I, I would think, honestly, that this was your second or third interview. You're doing such a good job. That, so, I mean, that's the level of confidence I'm going with, Jeff, for, uh, for real. No. You, you're, you're earning it, and I love it. I, I, this is, I feel like this is, this is my first interview, too. You are making it so easy. I, that's, that's great. I, I love the feeling of a first time. Uh, Jeff, I, now let me ask you something I'm nervous about. Uh, your, your last name, I'm pronouncing it correct, right? A Astroff? Yes, you are. Mm, whew, that's a uh, weight off my mind. Okay. The interview can only go <laughs> up, uh, go uh, uphill from here. Yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's actually, uh, it's a tricky one. And, and, uh, when I had kids, it was, uh, it was tricky too, because we, you know, had a son and we wanted one of our choices was a serious, uh, true story. Our choices were Harry and Jack and it just, didn't work out that way because of uh, the beginning of my name. So uh, we, we had to go away from uh, any possible uh, problems with uh, pronunciation. But you are safe so far. Great, great, great. So you are a man of many hats. Uh, you uh, are a writer, producer, uh, and one of the uh, two creators, I believe, uh, uh, behind Trial and Error, the, the new show you're working on? Yeah, so... Um, uh, I, I do, I am known for my uh, sharp hats. Right now I'm, I'm wearing a baseball cap, sometimes a fedora. Um, I, uh, you know, a, a kind of misconception about TV writers when you see uh, things like, uh, I happen to be executive producer, head writer, show writer, creator, and it really all is the same thing. Um, eventually, if you're a writer, you just, um, it's like being in, in the Army, you just kind of keep getting new titles and as opposed to a movie where a producer may be putting his own money on the line, uh, the only thing I put on the line every day is uh, the inside of my uh, intestinal tract, um, which is being eroded every moment uh, that I uh, run the show. But I'm, uh, I created the show. Uh, it was an idea I had uh, four years ago after being inspired by uh, watching a lot of true crime shows, including uh, The Staircase and... Um, I pitched it as a comedy maybe five years ago, and three years in a row, they said, no, that's not an idea for a comedy, and then finally I wore them down, uh, and uh, now we're in our second season of Trial and Error. That is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I, I love the idea of the, of the network TV scene as being in the army, being in the trenches. Uh, I just, yeah, it is. I, it's just way it's more dangerous. Just, oh, way more dangerous. I, I believe it, too. <laughs> yeah. More, more flashbacks. <laughs> oh boy um so i i should tell you that uh i when i knew i was going to interview you i was like oh i should definitely watch a couple episodes of trial and error just to keep uh just keep up with it and, and so i can ask you questions about it uh cut to a whole season's worth of tv later uh because i Beautiful. i loved it so much i had to binge it all in one sitting like i didn't even take a break well thank you that's that's it's uh again the the original uh, conceit of the show um, was that it would be it would be something to binge watch, but that's what my my wife and I had just you know gone for you know however seventeen straight hours of just watching uh, the staircase without you know feeding our kids or ourselves. And I was like, I wish there was a, a comedy that you could do this with. And I said, you know what? What if this kind of show was a comedy? And um, you know, my wife at that point fell asleep because we hadn't done anything but watch TV for the last, you know, 10 days, but, um, you know, that was kind of the, that was kind of the root of the show, was to have a, a comedy that you would actually binge watch, and, and have it be a real mystery, the, the, the fun of this show is that most of the time in the room, uh, we spend breaking what the crime is, and what the crime beats are, and the characters are, are, you know, very easy to write for, and the actors are unbelievable that it's, uh, once we once we know what the crime is, once we break the crime, um, then then it's easy to write. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> I can honestly say I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the show now, uh, a recent fan, but huge nonetheless. 
Thank you. I love the mockumentary style uh, it, that it's going with. Uh, and, I, you know, the, the binge the bingeability is great, too, because every time I watch it, you're, one of the openings or closings, I either go, I want to watch, I'm going to watch this next 22 minutes right now, or, oh, man, I got to watch the next 22 minutes. Uh, there you go. And, well, you're, you're a perfect, you're a perfect view of that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, you, we, you know, we made a decision uh, very, very early on um, because, uh, to do that where every single episode ends with a, a cliffhanger. And super fans will also know that the episodes are filled with Easter eggs and including on the, um, in the title uh, sequence, which this year is going to be shorter just because we want to pack every episode with as much uh, show as we can. Uh, there's a bunch of pictures on the murder board and one of them changes every episode. And if you find that picture that changes, uh, that's a big clue to what's going to happen in the episode and to solving the crime. Oh my goodness. Are you gonna are you telling me I have to watch the whole season one again? Because challenge accepted, sir. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> You'll actually see that if uh, without giving I, I, I hope that most people have seen season one, but if you if you watch season one closely, uh, as I'm sure you know that the, the all the answers are there as to uh, who did it and, and uh, we the murder is actually seen uh, towards the end of season one. So, uh, yeah, I, so I, the first <laughs> I, man, I, I, I love the back and forth of whether or not I think, because the, the initial premise of the show is, uh, uh, a legal team trying to get off a, a suspected murderer, John Lithgow being the murderer, who is just this great quirky, quirky character. Uh, do you, did, when you were writing this part, did you always imagine John Lithgow as a, uh, as that person or a, or did you have a different type in mind? No, the, the, uh, you know, in, in the same way, the same thing happens this way. I'm always hesitant to say, uh, that, uh, so, uh, Mr. Sir, His Majesty, uh, John Lithgow was not our first choice. Um, <laughs> John was on our radar when, when, uh, when we wrote it, you know. It was originally, um, we, he was actually the fifth person who came up. Wow. And, um, in the same way this year, Kristen Chenoweth was the fifth person who came up. And not that we don't love Kristen, didn't love John, it's just that they were both, they weren't on our radar because John was doing The Crown and Kristen actually had another project. And, you know, they both became available uh, just really at the right time. It really, they were both heaven sent. So with, with John, you know, I told the story before, the, the first, and this is all due respect to John, and nobody could have done it better. Just like this year, there was nobody else for the part of Lavinia Peck Foster than Kristen Chenoweth. There was nobody else other than Larry Henderson, uh, none other than John Lipset for Larry Henderson. You know, I, um, my first choice was Steve Corral. That was the first thought that I wrote him in mind. Uh, and then we had talked for a while with Kevin Klein, uh, who was known as Kevin D. Klein because he turns out so much TV. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but we were on the phone with Kevin Klein for an hour and a half, and we, you know, my partner, Matt Miller, and I were hugging each other during the call, like, this is it, where Kevin Klein's going to do a TV show, and he's going to do our show, and, and um, it didn't happen. And then uh, we went through a couple other avenues, and then it been John Lithgow, and we were like, well, of course. And the first thing we learned from John Lithgow was that his name is pronounced Lithgow, uh, and not Lithgow, um, and... Um, it was just amazing because we spoke to John on the phone and John said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm doing this show in England called The Crown. I've worked 10, 10 straight day, 10 straight hours in a row and I read your script and I can't get it out of my mind and I read it again and I read it again. He's like, what have you ever seen me in that would make me, that would make you think I would be good for this? And I said, every single thing you've ever done. And, um, you know, we, we talked and with John for hours and just, you know, to John's credit, he just wanted to know what kind of guys we were and, and, and how would it be to, to work with us. And cause he's, you know, he's has the choice to do whatever he wants now. And, uh, we were lucky enough that, um, we had a lot of mutual friends and, and, uh, we saw the role similarly. Although John, it took John a, a, a beat to figure out what to do with the character. And we had asked him, um, if he wanted to know whether or not Larry was guilty, and he took a second, and he said yes, and he was the only one in the show who knew whether or not 
he was guilty. Wow, that is interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to tell him in person. I think he's a graceful uh, roller sizer. Really, real great. Uh, uh, that was what I think. It was, it was his big regret in the show was that um, as a man of a certain age, uh, he could not get insurance by <laughs> roller sizing, so he had to have a model of it. And he he was eager to do everything, and he told us, he said, let me do it, let me do the roller skating. <laughs> or I can't we, whenever we saw him on roller skates, that had to be locked down or it was a stunt double. <laughs> Oh man, that's uh, I love all those little technical details of of going yeah. through. That's that's just great. Um, I also but he would have done it. He was he was tireless. He was tireless and gave us more than we ever 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 could have imagined. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to bring up the the level of comedy he brings to it too, because the show has kind of a, a darker sense of humor than I first thought when I'm when I initially start watching a network show. I mean, the opener starts with the murder. Uh, and Larry waiting for the cable guy and being more upset about that than the actual murder. And then that, that's even before the dog gets uh, uh, dragged behind a car, <laughs> which and uh, yeah. like it's just it's it's very interesting. How did you have any pushback with uh, with NBC or any of the network uh, heads about like the the little, uh, the darkness of the show at all? Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, it was it was actually it was funny. I was telling this story. Uh... I was telling the story uh, yesterday, but before that, one of the reasons that um, one of the reasons that the, that one of them is my home studio and my my family uh, away from family um, uh, was very reluctant was I was pitching this show and uh, I said it's about a guy who who's convicted of murdering his wife in the South and the guy comes down to defend him and support the character. And they said, No, we want you doing a comedy. And I said, this is a comedy, and all the women I pitched to were like, it's not a comedy about a guy who's convicted of killing his wife, that's not a comedy. And so, it like, so there was a big pushback. Once, um, once, uh, like, Making a Murder and Serial became popular, they saw the, the, uh, they saw the, the opening to do it as a comedy, and, um, but yeah, it was very, very, you know, one of the reasons that we start the show with the following of the documentary uh, is they wanted us to spell everything out that it was a documentary, and they were so worried in testing that people wouldn't know it was a comedy. Because when you test the show, it, they take 50 people or 150 people off the street. They don't tell them what they're watching, how long it's going to be, if it's a comedy or not. And we were convinced that people would laugh within the first 10 seconds, you know, and even hearing... Some people heard John Lester's voice and, and they started laughing. Um, so that was good. But yes, there was the one real pushback I got, which they didn't let me do, was we had a scene uh, in in the pilot where, um, and there's, there's a fragment of it in there now, but we had a scene where the uh, arresting officer, they showed the tape of the, uh, the first officer on the scene, and um, it's, you know, you see the Margaret body through the window, and Larry invites the officer in and says, I'm so sorry, you know, the house is a mess. You know, Margaret usually cleans up, but obviously that's not going to happen. And the, here, let me get you some coffee. And he keeps walking back and forth, forgetting things, stepping over the body, and says, you have to watch this. I'm sorry, I'm going to clean this up, but what can I get you? And they were, it was so funny to me that this guy was so oblivious, and they hated it. <laughs> and I got almost unanimous pushback on that. And they said, you can't. He seems too guilty. And, in fact, it wasn't until the end of the second episode where he cried that people thought, oh, maybe he didn't do it. And they just thought, you know, you're watching an episode of Dexter. And uh, that's what the great thing is about uh, having John is that he was in Dexter, but he was also in Third Rock with the Sun, but people thought too much for Dexter in it. And, so, yeah, and even our director, when we showed um, what happened with um, the guy on the roof, we actually showed someone die in the show. Uh, this year, I believe, five or six characters die. It's, it's a bloodbath. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But And, and, and we already got to a bit. We're not making fun of murder at all. We're poking fun of the people's attitudes towards it and also the, um, you know, basically the, the the genre no i i get it i and uh if, if that scene had happened i i d doubt you i would have laughed but then again i'm a horrible person so there's that yeah uh <laughs> it's a funny scene you're a good person 
Uh, <laughs> uh, you just saying that because I like your show. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, exactly why. Uh, but you know that's fine. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about one of my other favorite characters, which is Anne. Uh, of course, played by Sherry Shepard. Um, she is constantly hilarious with all of her different psychological disorders and tics. Like, is there like is this just one person's job to like keep track of? all the different conditions that she has so that you guys just keep consistent on it because she has like what seven different conditions now since season one it it, it... uh she yeah she has we added we added about six or seven more in the second season too oh my so God. a couple of things um i um i'm always you know when you come up with like the secretary of section you, you uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of territory that's been covered with that, and we kind of wanted to make uh, her and Dwayne just the, the worst possible team, and yet great at their jobs. And and um, I've had some bad assistants in in uh, my history, none quite as bad as uh, as Anne. But I have a chiropractor who told me that he has facial blindness. I was like, what is that? And he said, I can't recognize you at all. He can't recognize his wife or his children. And I said, that is unbelievable. That would be an unbelievable trait for somebody who worked in investigating murders. And um, so we gave her facial blindness, and we said, like, what other, what other things can we give her? And, you know, and, and originally the the part was supposed to be for someone kind of like Rachel Dratch, who was like a little bit more hangdog. Mm-hmm. And then Sherry came in and played everything with a smile, and it made all the difference in the world. But... um just like every um, legal beat in the show, every disorder that Anne has is, is real. Yeah, that... it's, a, it's, a, it's a brain disorder that someone could have. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> uh, can your chiropractor recognize penises by any chance? Is that... uh, I did not find that out. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to say I did not find that out. I did not need an adjustment. Okay, because I I feel like that detail was in the show. Like, oh, I wonder if that's a thing he learned, or if that was just an off color joke too. Uh, I'm glad to see that wasn't no from comment. personal experience. No comment. No comment. Oh my goodness. Uh, but uh, yeah. So, what's it like writing for a show like a mockumentary comedy as opposed to like a regular sitcom or or a more uh, you know. Uh, standard scripted show with you know the 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 tricks and jokes you can play with a camera like how does like how does that factor in your mind when you're juggling these concepts around? So um, yeah, so the reality here you know, is really putting the cart behind my process. Uh, I had never done a single camera show before. You know, I had I I cut my teeth. My very first show was a show called Hang with Mr. Cooper, which is a multicam. Mm-hmm. I wrote a show called Duckman, which was animated. Um, that that was it. That was as close to not working on a stage. I worked literally 23 years on uh, sitcoms, including probably the greatest sitcom of all time, Friends, um, and arguably. And, um, you know, I cut my teeth on that kind of joke set up, joke set up, joke set up. But I also realized I don't watch sitcoms anymore. And they don't, you know, maybe that's just me, but I didn't, they didn't make me laugh anymore. And, you know, I looked at the things that made me laugh. And I, I just was tiring myself personally of of the same type of you know entrance jokes and the same type of waiting for the audience to you know get pregnant with a punchline and and I just thought you know I wanted to do a single camera show and I had heard that at Modern Family the hours were good okay. so I said I'll do a mock doc and uh, that's what that's what happened and uh, so that's it it was. A, it was sheer uh, desire to go home uh, um, that that started it, and then of course once I uh, I realized you know once I found uh, trial and error as a as a as a format that I was like wow this works perfectly and our director we hired with that Jeff Smith is a absolute genius and he his background is document is, is being a documentarian and and he would actually. Um, Keep us honest. You know, he did the show, the movie Spellbound, which was his first uh, movie at a film school, which is an amazing documentary on spelling bees. And um, and then he did sixty episodes of The Office and Parks and Rec. And he kept us honest in terms of what would be in a documentary and what wouldn't be. And, and we actually had to cut out some characters because of that. Oh, okay. Uh, that is 
<laughs> man, that's that's very fascinating. I I agree with you about the the sitcom format. I actually think that one of the last ones I actually found particularly funny was one of yours in the New Adventures of Old Christine. Uh, yeah, I, I should I should not have eliminated that because that was one of my favorite jobs, and and uh, you know aside from my current cast and uh, John Lithgow, Julie and Louis Dreyfus has just been a wonder to work with and mm -hmm. for and. She's uh, she's unbelievable. She's as good a person as she is a, a an actor and a comedian. That's high praise. Oh, that that's that's great. I, I love her work as well. And you, and of course, you worked with the the other Seinfeld crew member um, on Duckman. I believe Jason Alexander was the voice for that one, right? Yes. yes. And and yes, Jason also came in to do uh, an episode of Old Christine. Uh, is is uh is animation any different? So you've worked on that, and I believe you worked on one other animated project, correct? Uh, no, I had my name on. Uh, I had my name on uh, the marvelous uh, thornberries. I think it's not the marvelous thornberries. What's it called? Something the thornberries. Oh, the wild thornberries. Wild thornberries. Sorry. Yes, yeah, it was the original title of that. We just kind of created a show called the Adventures of Nigel Thornberry or something. But um, we, um, you know, yeah, animation is, is is. I wanted to do a show kind of like in trial and error. I wanted to do a show that was close to. The Simpsons, you know, it's funny, people people compare our show a lot to Parks and Rec, which I'll, I'll take, for sure, I'll take, uh, I'll take that comparison, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's not designed to be that way at all, it's way more designed to be like The Simpsons, if we're stealing from anybody, The Simpsons, you know, the town of East Peck um, is, um, I was much more immersed in The Simpsons uh, world that I was in Parks and Rec world. So the town of East Pack is, you know, it's its own town, but I, you know, this year especially, because we were in Vancouver, we got to show, be outside more. Uh, we got to show a lot more of the town and meet more of the townspeople, and, and uh, I, I like, I love them in the world. So for me, it's, it's being able to, with a single camera and with animation, you're able to tell different types of jokes, and you're able to move the bar on a joke. I mean, you and, and also similarly, you know, people like multi cabs because they're more, they feel like they're more intimate, and you could really, you know, with friends you could laugh and cry with the characters, and they're great. And and I think uh, the same is true for a um, for single cam. And we we have we have a moment this season, which is uh, the entire crew was sobbing after we filmed it, and and I won't give it away, but it's like when you can get that and giant laugh in the same show you're you're that's exactly what i said for wow that that makes me super want to watch the next season right now uh <laughs> i do too uh, I, uh, you, you mentioned uh, about world building too, and I, I didn't want to get out of here before I, we mentioned East Peck a little bit more. Um, so did you do research on my hometown where I grew up for East Peck? Cause it kind of feels <laughs> like you did. Like it feels very personal. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, it, it's very, it's very funny. I'm trying to think of like where I took inspiration for East Peck. I, you know, I, I looked up again everything, and and this year we go deeper into the East Peck history, and, and all of it's based on really like stuff that I've googled about small towns, and 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 it's very. I want to be very careful on this year. It's much more, um, you know, one of the fears that the network had. It's funny we got uh, on the the pilot episode last year, the pilot table read, which is usually the worst day of any writer's life, <laughs> uh, professionally, because you get, you see something that you built so hard get destroyed, <laughs> and the pilot, pilot table read um, went so well last year that we, the head of NBC, Bob Greenblatt, said, don't change anything, wow. nothing, except for one thing, we're afraid we're going to get letters from people who can't see faces, and I said, well, we'll probably send them to NBC. <laughs> And he said, we just want you to change it to facial amnesia. That was it. <laughs> so the, the other thing people were on the script were worried about is, are we, and, and some of the reviews, and this really hurt my feelings, some of the reviews said we make fun of Southern people, and it's absolutely not true. There's no intention of that. It's, it's, it's a love letter to a small town. I grew up in a very small town in the south shore of Long Island, um, and I lived in a small town in the Midwest. My wife, uh, Grew up in a very small town in Oregon, uh, where I was asked if I was a Northeasterner. 
Um, <laughs> and that's where that that's where that came from. So these are these are bars from my small town, my wife's small town, and you know, you're kind of fantasy town where everybody knows your name, and, and that's kind of what I wanted the town to be. Is a place where you know um, it's a mysterious place that it's like either the greatest place to live or the worst place to live, and you have to decide. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it was bringing me flashbacks of pumpkin festivals and, uh, you know, like, and, and getting ripped off for paying three bucks for a steak. Like, that was like, I'm like, oh, man, you got, even before, even before Dwayne said anything, I was like, man, you got ripped, buddy. Like, that's not, and I'm like, damn it. So, so true. Uh, how dare you attack me with the truth? Uh, but Jeff, this has been fantastic. Uh, it's you i've been talking i think both of our first interviews have done amazingly well i am uh, that is what i like to hear jeff i, I can't even oh Great. my goodness so excited uh Great. Well, tell everyone you know, we're season three. yes yes okay so yeah for everyone I, listening please 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 uh tune in get that tivo hot and ready or, or, or fire up your amazon prime account what, whatever you got to do uh make season three of this show happen because i already know yeah. that season two will not be enough for me my 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 uh <laughs> my 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 murder lust will not be satiated by just this season so get on out there everybody and once again thank, thank you jeff you so for uh interviewing me it's been an absolute pleasure uh, have a great it's rest of your day, and uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see you later, guys. Bye.